This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. The breathtaking beauty of Canada's Yukon Territory has captivated travelers for generations. But when Philip Frazier of Anchorage, Alaska picked up a lone hitchhiker, the wilderness became the gateway to a nightmare. In 1990, four men were cast adrift when their fishing boat sunk off the coast of Georgia. After an incredible four-day ordeal, one of them was rescued. As for the other three, a series of strange phone calls suggests that they are being held against their will in a foreign country. When he was 20, Mac McDonald fell madly in love with a girl next door. A year later, Mac met his child for the first and last time. Now that child could inherit Mac's estate estimated at more than a million dollars. Freewheeling Las Vegas was a perfect locale for Max Carson, a fast-talking, self-styled film producer. In reality, Carson was a hustler and ex-cop named William John Wood. He is now wanted for rape. Join me for these intriguing new stories. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Alaska, America's last frontier. Highway 1 is its lifeline, a thin asphalt ribbon which cuts through Canada's Yukon Territory to connect Alaska to the continental United States. On June 14, 1988, 25-year-old Philip Frazier, the son of two physicians, left his home in Anchorage to enroll in a pre-med course at Evergreen College in Washington State. Philip had packed up everything he owned for the trip, including two handguns. On June 17th, after losing two days to car trouble, Philip crossed the border into Canada. Hi, where are you coming from? Alaska. Alaska, where are you headed? Washington, on the student. Going to school down there then? Yeah. Anything on board, uh, any goods that you purchased that you're bringing across? Um, just my books and things like that for school. At Beaver Creek, Philip was entering into Canada yeah. from Alaska into our Yukon Territory. And uh, okay, Philip sure. did declare that he had two firearms of his own. And at that point, our Canada Customs people seized the firearms from him, as it is illegal for Americans to uh, enter Canada with any kind of a firearm. After a one-hour delay, Philip Fraser was on his way. His guns became the property of the Canadian government. The next day, 600 miles south of the border checkpoint, a hitchhiker was dropped off at the 40-mile flat cafe owned by Gay Frocklidge. Gay and her daughter, Tina, were on duty. The individual that dropped him off didn't come into the cafe, just dropped him off and left. And just looking at him through the window, uh, it, it, there was something wrong. He didn't, there was something wrong with him, you know, in appearance, wasn't comfortable. And uh, I said to uh, Tina, uh, We've got a winner here. There's something wrong with this guy. I remember saying to Mom, you know, maybe he escaped from a mental institution because he was so strange. I think we've got a problem here. Yeah, are you going to stick around? Yeah, I, I think I better best not leave you alone. I wouldn't leave her alone in the uh, just building with him just go ahead and as there was nobody else there at the time. And so uh, I said to Tina, well, you go ahead and take care of him, then I'll just hang around. As I passed the side window, I seen a small black uh, car pull up right to the side of the cafe. And the young man in the car didn't uh, 
didn't get out of the car, but proceeded to act like he was searching his car, like he had misplaced something that he needed. Uh, during this time was when another vehicle pulled up to the service station. Yeah, Tina, there's a car at the pumps. Do you want to serve him gas? And I'll just stay in here. OK, sure. Tina Frocklidge went to the parking lot to pump gas for another customer. She and Philip Frazier exchanged hellos. Is that everything? Yeah. Gay and Tina were relieved when the hitchhiker finished his meal. They remember that he paid his bill in Canadian money. I watched the uh, hitchhiker go out and approach Fraser. Yeah, I'm heading that way, too. Good. Yeah, how about a ride? Uh, I, I've got to go in here yet. You sure? Yeah. All right. The car sat for a few minutes, and then he pulled ahead like he had second thoughts. Still heading in this direction? Thought you were going to have a bite to eat. Mind if I go with you? The hitchhiker just ran beside him and pulled the door open, and the uh, young man in the car proceeded to let him enter. strange thing was is as they left the yard, Tina made some remark about he's going to live to regret this day he picked this man up. It was like a sixth sense that this man was capable of anything. Eight hours later, and 200 miles south of the 40 Mile Flat Cafe, Eddie and Pauline Olson of Kitwanga, Canada, pulled over to help a stranded motorist. Oh, wow, am I glad to see you guys. Hey, I think my car ran out of gas. I don't know what happened because I stopped at the last gas stop, but it just quit. Um, I'm on my way to college, and I've got all my stuff in the back of the car. And you could tell he was nervous, but I thought that, well, you know, he was just scared of being out here this late at night, didn't want, you know, to stay out here because it's kind of a remote area, eh? And um, at that point, I just said, well, I'll tow you home and we'll figure it out in the morning. Now you can sleep down here. We've had quite a few people stay down here, and they have a pretty good sleep. No, this will be great. I really appreciate everything you guys have done for me. You can just pick out whichever coach you want there, and there's some blankets right there. OK. Have a good sleep, and we'll see you in the morning. All right, thanks. Sleep good. He slept downstairs in our basement. And I have about uh, 12 or 15 guns on a gun case down there. And where he slept, the guns were just right, right beside him there. Oh, good morning. How'd you sleep? Oh, I slept great, thanks. Oh, sit down and have a coffee. Oh, thank you. The next morning, the young man told the Olsons that his parents were both doctors in Anchorage and that he was on his way to college in the States to study medicine. And uh, I really wanted to thank you guys. Well, I got talking to him about his car, and he told me that if I was interested, he would sell it to me. And I said, well, I was interested because all he wanted was a plane ticket to Seattle. But I said, the only way I would buy it is if you waited till Monday and we went through customs. And he said that would be too late for him. Eh? I can't wait till Monday. I need to be in Seattle on Monday. I really can't wait. I really need to get going. Um, is there something I can do for your hospitality? Anything? The Olsons were surprised when the young man pulled out two wallets and began to behave secretively. He gave the Olsons $20 in American money, then left to fix his car. Thank you. Within an hour, the young man was back on the road headed south. The car trouble had turned out to be nothing more than a broken fan belt.
12 hours later, the charred ruins of Philip Frazier's car were found at a car wash in Prince George, British Columbia, 300 miles from the Olsons' home. The condition of the car after it was burned, uh, it was almost totally gutted out on the inside due to the, the fire and uh, fire damage to the outside as well. Nothing was found in the car of any significance. In fact, uh, none of Philip Fraser's belongings have ever been found. The parents were contacted in Alaska, and there was a, a great deal of investigation done at that point, uh, as Philip was considered a missing person and potentially a homicide victim. I was sure that, uh, you know, that there had been foul play. But I kept hoping, thinking of all sorts of um, alternatives, like uh, uh, maybe he decided he wanted to ditch his car and be in his own. Uh, or, and I knew, you know, intellectually, I knew that was wrong because he really loved his car. Six weeks later, a body was discovered in a gravel turnaround area 70 miles from the Olsons' home. At the time of the discovery of the body, it was already well known about the incident of the, the car burning in the car wash in Prince George. And almost immediately, investigators were looking at the remains being that of, of Philip Fraser. Uh, in order to do a positive identification, we required dental records from Alaska, which we obtained very quickly and were able to make that identification. I think, <clears throat> excuse me. Any parent who loses a kid feels like he's lost part of himself. I think that's the, one of the things you definitely feel. You feel like you uh, aren't intact yourself. I think it's very difficult to describe it in words. Um, you feel like your life and your family has been truncated, cut off. I felt you know, angry bitter and I wondered what sort of a person what kind of a person would uh, would destroy someone who was uh, so idealistic and so full of life what really happened along that lonely stretch of highway one the Royal Canadian Mounted Police theorized that the mystery hitchhiker learned everything he could about Philip Fraser and then killed him they believe the hitchhiker assumed Philip's identity, stole his possessions, and finally attempted to destroy the car. In my mind, he most definitely is a dangerous person. He's taken one life. Uh, he has the capability of taking more. As to whether he's done this type of thing before, uh, I, I couldn't say that, but we know he has taken one life and I would consider him very dangerous. These are composite drawings of the hitchhiker based on the descriptions of Gay and Tina Frockledge and Eddie and Pauline Olson. He is Caucasian, about five feet, nine inches tall, and weighs approximately 225 pounds. He has a flabby belly which overhangs his belt and is between 20 and 25 years old. He has brown hair and brown eyes. The authorities believe that the hitchhiker is familiar with the Toronto area and the Seattle, Washington area. He may be masquerading as Philip Innes Frazier. Among the items never recovered were Philip Frazier's birth certificate, visa, passport, and checkbook. Next, three fishermen are lost at sea, but some believe they survived and are being held against their will. The vast oceans of the world have captivated humankind since the dawn of civilization. The young especially seem drawn by the promise of adventure and romance. But there are also a thousand hidden dangers. Sometimes the sea can be an unforgiving mistress. In 1990 alone, 865 people drowned in American coastal waters. April 12, 1990, Richland Hill, Georgia, just south of Savannah. 
Four commercial fishermen prepare to embark on a seven-day expedition in the Atlantic. The captain is 23-year-old Billy Joe Neesmith. The crew includes his brother, Nathan, his nephew, Keith Wilkes, and a friend, Franklin Brantley. We ready, let's go fishing. Franklin, you in? I'm in, I'm in, let's go. All right, it's all yours. In the late afternoon, they set off in the Casey Nicole, a snapper boat owned by Billy Joe Neesmith's employer. The boat had recently been returned to service after five weeks in dry dock for maintenance. We were headed out probably approximately close to 90 miles offshore. I guess it was somewhere around 3.30, 4 uh, in the morning, that next morning, it was still dark. I had got up and was operating the boat and the boat just seemed to be sluggish, you know, like it wanted to bust through the waves, kind of like a submarine or something. It didn't want to ride over the waves. Something's wrong. Man, don't feel right. Billy Joe! So I told my brother, he he was laying in the bunk. I woke him up, I said, Billy Joe, I said, oh, son, I said, something's wrong with the boat. What's out there? Man, I won't stay on course. What do you mean it won't stay on course? I'm losing 10, 15 degrees, man. I tried it manually and it, it keeps going off. And then I tried it uh, with an automatic pilot and it just, it won't hold, man. Jesus. We got to noticing around, the boat was riding pretty deep in the water. Jesus, Nathan, we're two foot down. Did you check the engine? It sounds like it sputtered a bit. No, I ain't checked it, man. We better check it, though. Oh, man, Nathan, we got two foot of water down there. Let me see that light. There you go. Nathan, did you hit them pumps yet? Nope. Hit him a couple times. And we started working on our pumps, oh, trying to get our pumps to work to pump the boat out. How about now? Nothing. Damn. We got to get them boys up next. So we got to start bucking this water out here right now. The other crew members slept down in the bow. And when we turned on the light, we noticed there was water about a foot deep down in the bunks where they were at. Hey, we're sinking, huh? Come on, get Sink out. It out man. Come on. And we got in a line and started passing the bucket, you know, trying to bail the boat out. In the meantime, we took the life raft out. It was a two-man life raft. We'd been hollering Mayday on the radio. We had Billy Joe on it, working it. Casey Nicole, we're taking the water, going down. Somebody come back to the place. Never did get anywhere with that. And the engine finally stalled. Casey Nicole, we're going. All power on the Casey Nicole was lost. The radio was useless. The four men abandoned ship. The life raft was kind of rotten. It had a hole in the side of it up on the top. We don't know for sure if the anchor snagged it and tore this hole in it, or if the thing was just rotten and it eventually wore in it. We don't really know what happened there, but we do know that it had a hole in it about the size of a quarter. By sunrise, the life raft was sinking fast. Then salvation came floating by. The hatch cover from the Casey Nicole. I think I got it. You got it? Oh, it's heavy. What's your door to Come on, buddy. I'm tired. Oh. Come on, buddy. 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 The four men tethered the raft to the hatch cover and clambered aboard. It was then that Nathan Neesmith spotted the hull of the Casey Nicole in the distance. It looked like it was maybe three or four miles from us. I said, I don't know what kind of chance we got, but at least maybe one of us can make it to the boat and get some kind of help. Well, that's what I struck out to do. And they started hollering, no, no, you come back, you stay with us. Uh, we can't separate up, we separate up. We're gonna be split up and ain't no telling what to go wrong. I just kept swimming and kept swimming. I swam from probably about 9 o'clock that morning. And just before dark that afternoon, I got to where I thought was what the boat was. And I got to looking around, and I seen the stern of the boat sticking up at a distance, probably another 100 yards or so to the right of it. So I just kept swimming. I done swam till I thought there wasn't no more swimming in me. and. I drank so much salt water trying to swim in it. And 
I was just real weak. As darkness fell, Nathan lost sight of his companions. He spent a long, harrowing night clinging to the hull of the Casey Nicole. The next morning, a freighter passed within three miles of Nathan. This ship here looked like it made about four stops, maybe five stops. And each time it would stop or circle, I could see a fog of smoke boil out of it. And it was in the direction that my uh, other mates had went. So I figured that maybe it had stopped to pick them up. The freighter continued its odd maneuvers for nearly three hours, then disappeared. For two and a half days, Nathan Neesmith drifted and prayed that the Casey Nicole would stay afloat. All seemed lost until a large wood and styrofoam bait box ripped loose from the boat's deck and popped to the surface. I couldn't tell what it was for a minute because I was scared and everything like that. And I swam over to it where I could get a better view of it. Like I say, I was pretty weak. I couldn't, I was done about starved down. I was hungry and thirsty and really weak. And I got to the front of it, and bless God, the whole front was out. I mean, it was just like, just like a boat to me. I mean, it, it looked like just something that I needed at the moment. really hot. I mean, I was getting real sunburnt. My skin was turning real, real red, and I was very close to dead. I mean, actually, I was to the stage of death, but I knew I couldn't give up because I had two kids and a wife at home, and I remember saying, God, please let me go home to my wife and kids and be able to raise my kids, you know? Don't let me die at this, uh, in this ocean. At 10 a.m. on April 15, 1990, Nathan Neesmith was finally rescued 20 miles off the coast of Georgia. He had been adrift without food or water for four days. Nathan Neesmith's companions were never found. A large-scale search mounted by the Coast Guard yielded no trace of the life raft or the hatch cover. But Nathan and his family never gave up hope that the three men might somehow have survived. It seemed a futile hope until a strange telephone call was made to the home of Nathan's sister, Onita. It was October 5, 1990, six months after the Casey Nicole had sunk. Onita's mother-in-law answered the telephone. Hello. What? I can't understand you. Can you speak English? The caller, a man, spoke in Spanish and seemed unable to understand English. No. I can't understand a word you're saying. You can speak English? All this person would keep saying is repeating our phone number and saying our name, and that's all. Then it was just like a, a cutoff. There wasn't anything after that. And, you know, we just kept saying, hello, hello, and it was just cut off, static cut off. That same day, an unusual call also came into the home of Doug Tyson, owner of the ill-fated Casey Nicole. Hello. Once again, the caller was a man. The only English words he said were the Tyson's name and telephone number. That was strange. What do you mean? They were speaking in Spanish. In Spanish? We didn't say anything about the call when we got it. Six weeks uh, later after that, about six weeks, we were down visiting with the Neesmith family. And uh, they started telling us about their call. And after they got through, I said, how long ago was this? Asked them. They thought back a minute. And they said, uh, about six weeks. I looked at my wife. She looked at me. And she said, nodded her head. She said, about the same time. I said, yeah. Over the next year, five more calls came in, three to Onita and two to the Tysons. Finally, on March 6, 1991, the caller spoke a single sentence in English. Hello. Excuse me? I said just the very simple words, not I'm bringing it home, I'm bringing him home. Just said I'm bringing him home. That was it. Hello? Hello? 
After only a moment, the connection was broken. There have been no calls since. The Neesmiths and the Tysons are convinced that the three missing men were taken aboard the passing freighter and perhaps transported to a foreign country against their will. I think they're somewhere being held. I really do. And I think that whoever called us is putting their self on the line because my brother or my nephew or our friend, one of the three has made a friend, a very dear friend, because this person that's doing this is probably putting himself on the line to do it. You know, in my mind, people are lost at sea. They're never found, I realize that. But there's no explanation for where the debris went. And then the fact that Nathan seen the ship stop the first day, uh, you add all those together with the phone calls, and uh, I think it adds up to a tremendous amount of hope. In my heart, uh, yes, I feel like they're alive. I mean, uh, I think they had a lot, I know they had a lot better chance of surviving than I did. I don't think that I would have ever made it not knowing that they couldn't make it. What really happened to the lost crewman of the Casey Nicole? The Coast Guard search was the largest ever conducted in the area of the Atlantic Ocean where they disappeared. Officially, Billy Joe Neesmith, Keith Wilkes, and Franklin Bradley are presumed dead. Unofficially, there seems reasonable hope that they may still be alive. When we return, one man's poignant search for his long lost child who stands to inherit more than a million dollars. For most parents, seeing their baby for the very first time is a moment of unrestrained joy. No, I... But for this young father, it was a moment of confusion and panic that drove him away I'm sorry. from the girl he loved and the child he has not seen since. Max, don't go. Don't. Four decades later, the young man is 63 years old. W.B. Mac McDonald is now a wealthy businessman with a sizable estate. Yet he is very much alone. Mac has never been married. No one from his immediate family is still alive. For 30 years, Mac McDonald has been searching for his child, but has found only frustration. Those lost years are the one thing his money cannot buy. Mac's story begins in 1948 in Pomona, California when he fell madly, perhaps tragically, in love with the girl next door. Her name was Mary Helen Carr. She was just 16 years old. The first time that I, I noticed my neighbor, she was in a swing on her front porch. She was in a pair of, of white slacks and a light-colored blouse and very pleasing to look at. While she was there on the swing, there was uh, definite attraction both ways. However, I guess I was a little shy at that time that uh, I didn't speak to her at that time. It was, it was several months before I finally began to speak to her. Nice bike. Yeah, I like to keep it clean. My name's Mac. Mary Helen. Nice to meet you. I've seen you before. Uh, I'm just cleaning my bike. Uh, would you like to go for a ride sometime? <laughs> my mother would forbid me to ride that. Especially with you. Is your mother always here? The romance progressed slowly and discreetly. Mary Helen's mother was distrustful of Max's intentions. Still, the two young lovers saw each other at every available opportunity, until the inevitable day came when Mary Helen's mother caught them together. We were planning on a future together, and here were these uh, tremendous 
stumbling blocks being thrown out into the path. Mac felt he had no choice but to pack his bags and leave. His destination, the oil fields of Texas. Sorry. I was very much in love with her. My whole life was revolving around her Sorry. at that time. But with the disturbance that I was causing her at home, I thought, well, I'll get away a while, and maybe it'll solve some of these problems. We can be sure that, that what we're feeling for each other is going to last the rest of our lives. We had both agreed that this was the best thing to do, but it didn't, didn't make it any easier. Went directly to Houston. The only time I stopped on that trip was just for gas, because it, I was, it seemed like I'd left part of me in Pomona, and it didn't get any easier the more miles I got away from her. Three weeks later, Mac had established himself in Houston. He had no idea that Mary Helen had run away from home to join him. Mary Helen called me from the uh, bus station there in Houston, and she says, I'm here for good. And I told her I'll be right there. And I tore the, tore the streets up getting down to the bus station. It was a very happy reunion. Here we are. The next day, Mac and Mary Helen, posing as husband and wife, found an apartment and began right, planning for the rest call. of their lives. Oh, right. We're here for the apartment. You call. Their right. troubles seemed far behind them. They just got married, right? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Well, it's right here. Let me show you. It was happiness itself. It was the ultimate dream. The feeling that she she gave you, she was beautiful to look at, she was beautiful to talk to, and she gave you the incentive to tear the world up. I had a new neighbor. You did? Yeah. Are they nice? Yeah, they're nice. Great. One month later, Mac and Mary Helen's world would collapse again. It's very good. Hello? Just a minute. A friend tipped Mac off that the police are on their way to the apartment. Hello? Mary Helen's mother had made good on her threats. The authorities carried warrants charging Mac with statutory rape and illegally living with a minor. Right now. I'm so sorry. I don't know how she found out. It's not your fault. She must have talked to your mother or something. It's OK. It's not your fault. I don't know how she found That's fine. That's fine. We'll call you. Mac made his escape with no time to spare. left Texas, and it was in the afternoon. See, my like afternoon is when all these departures took place. And I didn't stop till I was out of the state of Texas. I was devastated again. They jerked her back to uh, California, and I had no way of contacting her again. A year passed. Mac returned to California to take a new job. One evening, he and a friend stopped off at a drive-in in Long Beach. Mac? Mary? I almost fell out of the car. The waitress, the car hop that came to wait on us was Mary Helen. Los Angeles is a big city. It was a big city then. And the possibilities of driving into a restaurant and having her, the waitress, was like hitting a kino ticket here in Reno. Well, listen, I can't really talk to you, but I get off work at 9. Do you want to come by my apartment? Yeah. Here's my address. Great. You can see our baby. I have a baby? I almost had heart failure. It took my breath away. Because I had no idea she was pregnant. There was that possibility, though. So I told her I'll be right over. <sighs> 
one up. With this baby in her arms. Come in, look. Well, I thought, well, the police department is probably on premises. Honey? You know, this is just a matter of time till I'm going to be shackled and in jail over this. So glad to see you. So I was so okay. distraught when her mother opened the door sure, hold him. that I overlooked the fact that she was about half civilized the first time she'd ever spoke to me civilly. I was in such a traumatic state of fear. The benefit of being able to hold, hold your baby for the first time, I, I missed that. Because all I could think of, either the law is in the bedroom or they're on the way. Mac, sit down. Mac was terrified that Mary Helen's mother still had a warrant out for his arrest. I can't. In California, statutory rape was punishable by up to 30 years in prison. Mac McDonald stayed for less than five minutes. He never even learned if the baby was a boy or a girl. I feel that I made the greatest mistake of my life by not staying there and writing it out. I don't think there was, uh, it probably, probably, well, it uh, been 40 years. That's what it's cost me. I feel that uh, the youngster's entitled to my estate. I'm not entitled to uh, be its father, probably. But I would wanna, I'd want that uh, youngster to know that even with the mistakes, that I love them, and I want them to have the best. The night of our broadcast, Mac McDonald learned that he had a daughter named Sherry. The long-awaited news came from a viewer in Dallas, Texas, Mary Helen Carr, Sherry's mother. Unlike many of the reunions we have featured, the end of this search evoked decidedly mixed emotions for Mac, for Mary Helen, and especially for their daughter, Sherry, who'd been raised by a loving and caring stepfather. I'm uh, 43 years old and pretty well set in my life and everything, and, and I didn't know what to think. You know, I'm very happily married and have two great kids and... You know, and we just are a normal American family, and, and this is quite a shock to everyone. One week after our broadcast, Mac McDonald arrived at Sherry's home in Denver, Colorado. For Mac, the reunion would bring a bittersweet and at times unsettling reconciliation with the past. Hello. Hi. Come on in. <laughs> It's hard to describe the feeling that I had for my daughter when I opened the door and she was there and I was able to hold her. I just tried to come to the realization that it really was my father standing there and I just does he, does he look like me? Does he act like me? You know, I have all these things I need to learn about him. I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm still in a state of shock. At this point in my life, to find that there is someone who is my father and who wants to establish a relationship with me, is just emotionally very traumatic. Apparently, he wants to be part of her life. And if that's the case, it's OK. I hope since he's gone to this much effort to find her that he doesn't bring any sorrow to her. The fact that I didn't stay and fight the battle, it's most unfortunate. I don't believe I would do it that way again. However, yesterday unfortunately can't be redone. I'd like to. No matter how you look at it, he left my mother with a, with a tiny baby, you know, and I have to deal with that. Um, I have to deal with the fact that I have a father who loves for me, who has raised me, who has cared for me, but I believe there's enough room in this family for everyone, and I sincerely mean that. Next, an ex-cop masquerading as a movie producer is wanted on charges of rape.
Every year, more than 20 million tourists descend upon Las Vegas, Nevada, the gambling capital of the world. Most come for only one reason, to spend and win money. It's no wonder that Vegas is also a mecca for every kind of hustler and con artist imaginable. In May of 1988, a self-styled star maker named Maxwell Carson arrived in Las Vegas. Carson was a smooth talker who dabbled in anything that might make money. Carson owned and operated a sports betting business, a fledgling film company, and a modeling agency. But Max Carson was a man with a dark past. He was an ex-cop gone bad whose real name was William John Wood. In 1972, Wood resigned from the Toledo, Ohio police force while under investigation for misconduct. Between 1977 and 1985, Wood served time for a number of offenses, from passing bad checks to impersonating a federal officer to assault with intent to rape. Okay, two down. In 1986, William John Wood moved to Las Vegas and became Max Carson. Max was absolutely obsessed with good-looking women. He would, especially with actresses, models, uh, any good-looking women, use the movie industry or use his clout as, quote, unquote, a movie producer to be, uh, could get them whatever they wanted. Tiffany? Yes. Hi, Mr. Carson. I'll see you now. In November of 1989, Carson began holding auditions for an upcoming film. One striking 19-year-old model caught his eye. We will call her Tiffany. Hi, how are you? Hi, great, thank you. Have a, have a seat. And you're? I'm Tiffany. Tiffany. I went in, I talked to him, and, uh, he told me a little bit about what the movie was about and uh, what I would be doing. And uh, I think there's a role in there for you. Of course, it's a speaking part. Ooh, <laughs> that'd be wonderful. You, uh, he had started talking about money, and I felt strange that he would offer a large amount of money to someone in my position that's never really had any acting before. So I talked to a couple agents, and they'd all heard of him. Uh, they had done their homework on him and found that there was nothing wrong with him. Super. Well, we've got your address and phone number and how to get in touch with you, and I appreciate you coming in. Tiffany had several other meetings with Carson, but the movie never got off the ground. Max Carson's empire was on the verge of collapse. We have employees that haven't been paid. Now, Bob, just relax. Have faith. We've been through so much together. By January of 1990, Max Carson would shut down his offices, yet he would maintain the illusion that he was still in full operation. Hello, I'd like to speak to Tiffany. In February, he called Tiffany and hired her as a last minute replacement model for a photo shoot. Problem down here, we had a photo session this afternoon. Carson arranged to meet her later that day at a restaurant on the Strip. Matt? Oh, hi, we're all set up. We got uh, two rooms set up, one for wardrobe. I met him in front of the coffee shop and he said that uh, we needed to go to uh, the motel there where they had set up a dressing room for me. Uh, oh, here's the limousine we're going to be using. And, uh, oh, I want to thank you very much for coming here on a short notice. This uh, shoot should be probably about two hours. You'll be done, and those dresses are just fine. Uh, I started to um, feel a little uncomfortable just because there was no one around. Tiffany, why don't you just go over there and fill out those forms, and I'll make a call. So I left the door open with my bag sitting between the room and the door yeah. so that it would make it a little bit difficult to get the door shut. Uh, this is Max Carson. Listen, I'm expecting somebody in very shortly and... Uh, would you Supposedly, uh, he was calling the makeup artist and uh, the photographer to let them know that we're here and waiting. Yes, okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And about that time, he had asked me if I would give him a hug. And I knew that I was in trouble. Uh, Max, I don't feel very comfortable, OK? Um, I'm not going to do this. What, what do you mean you don't feel very comfortable? Let's just forget about the whole thing, Max. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> don't make a sound. Do what I say, and I won't hurt you. <laughs> I 
I thought at that point that I was going to die. I thought I was going to be extremely lucky if I walked out. I tried very hard to cooperate, hoping that that would keep him from becoming more violent. I mean, this, this was scary. Later that day, Tiffany called the police. Even though Carson had threatened that he would accuse her of prostitution if she told anyone, Max Carson was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and battery. But by then, he had disappeared. Two months later, and 3,000 miles away, Max Carson surfaced in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Once again, he tried to work a scam on a beautiful woman. Hi. I hope I didn't keep you waiting. No, I just uh, got here. Paul, well, I've been here before. Why don't you? Uh... We walked into the no, lounge. Um, how about downstairs? I just want you Carson to and the out. woman had arranged to meet in the lobby of a Cocoa Beach hotel. Carson wanted to continue their conversation in a private room upstairs. He had convinced the woman to accept money for sex. Probably get something upstairs. Hold it right there. Cocoa Beach police, you're under arrest. Solicitation. Max Carson had walked into a clever trap. The woman was wearing a concealed wire as part of a sting operation. Carson pleaded guilty to solicitation of prostitution. At the time, police in Florida had no idea that he was wanted in Las Vegas. Take this guy downtown. Two days later, Max Carson was released from jail and disappeared once again. Only then did police finally discover his true identity. William John Wood was last seen in Reno, Nevada in March of 1991, still using the name Max Carson. He tried to run one of his scams on a model he had known in Las Vegas. When she confronted him with his past, he disappeared. Authorities believe he may be operating anywhere in the country, though he seems to prefer Florida, Nevada, or Southern California. They are certain that he is still masquerading as a film producer or talent agent. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.